Hello everybody out there in internet jazz land. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing okay in spite of these crazy uh, lockdown measures that are affecting pretty much all the Western countries right now. Um, my name is Jean, the Jazz and Blues Audiophile with you once again for another episode. It's been a while since I made an episode and uh, I decided to make one this time around discussing what has been called famously called in the last decades the blue note sound what is that all about the blue note sound when we say oh yeah the famous blue note sound well of course i think the uh the word is interchange we could interchange that uh, title to uh the rudy van gelder sound because of course the architect of the sound recordings made for the famous blue note jazz label um is the great Rudy Van Gelder, who is now considered pretty much a legend, passed away in 2016, is pretty much a legend of sound recording. He's one of the uh, pioneers of hi-fi sound recording. Uh, the te technology was still evolving pretty quickly as he was coming up and experimenting with different uh, microphones, different tape recorders, different formats of tape. Uh, he lived through the era of the, uh, the passing from the mono era. He even recorded on 78s. He started his recording career in 1946. Uh, did some recordings for a classical uh, label back then uh, before uh, going to Blue Note Records uh, officially in 1953. Uh, what happened is the founders of Blue Note, uh, Alfred Lyon and Francis Wolfe, I think it was Alfred Lyon that heard a recording he had done of uh, the great Gil Melly, a saxophonist, and um, he liked what he heard, he liked that sound, so he approached Van Geller and told him, hey, why would you like to come work for our label and uh, record our artists? And that's the way <clears throat> that that famous Blue Note sound, so to speak, uh, started because uh, Van Gelder bought, it brought his exper expertise. He had uh, at least seven years experience by the time he joined in 53 with the Blue Note rec uh, record label. And uh, although he was uh, working part-time as a, not, or more or less full-time as an optometrist and part-time as a recording engineer, uh, gradually uh, it started taking up more and more of his time and he eventually consecrated uh, his whole life to uh, recordings. And he became very, very busy. In 1959, he altogether quit the optometrist practice that he had and went into full-time, uh, just being full-time record recording engineer. Now, he's the architect of the Blue Note sound, and he um, really worked really hard to try and get the best sound capture possible for those recordings that he was to make for the Blue Note jazz label. Now, the reason why he, I think he particularly liked and made an effort to really get really good sound for Blue Note, he said it himself in an interview. First of all, what you have to know is Rudy Van Geller was a great jazz fan. He loved the music and the artists that he was recording. So that helps a lot when you love the music that you're recording and you want to put it in the best light possible, well, you take care of the way you're going to manage that recording and you try and do the best, your best job possible. He was also employed by two guys, Alfred Lyon and Francis Wolfe, who were also big fans of the music, big fans of jazz and uh, uh, tremendous supporters of the musicians, the great musicians that they had working for the label and recording for the label during the 50s and 60s. So. You've got three jazz lovers there. Francis Wolfe, Alfred Lyon, and Rudy Van Gelder. You put three jazz lovers together and you bring them a gang of absolutely dynamite jazz musicians. One of the greatest lineups of jazz musicians ever seen for just one single record label. And you've got the perfect mix. You've got people that care about the music, that want to put out a product. And I believe that Rudy, <clears throat> when he was recording these, uh, these great artists like Art Blakey, Lee Morgan, uh, you name it, Hank Jones, uh, Herbie Hancock, etc., etc., when he was recording all these great guys, he wanted to get the best sound possible, put them in the best light possible in order for their records to sell as much as possible and to present them 
in the best way possible to people's ears so that they might be turned on to this great phenomenon called jazz music, which he himself was passionate about. So that makes a big difference. And that's how he slowly began to create this sound that became known as the Blue Note sound. He even said in an interview that he would test out new equipment to find out if it was any good when he was doing recordings for the Prestige label, because he, of course he also recorded for a number of labels, other labels than Blue Note, Prestige, Savoy, Impulse, and many others. But he would test out his equipment while he was in these other recordings, doing recordings for these other labels. And if the equipment was really good, if the new microphone, the new tape machine he tried was given really good results for those labels, then he would take that equipment and bring it over for his Blue Note sessions, which for the first part from 1953 to 1959 occurred in his parents' living room, which he had converted uh, into a recording studio. And then in 1959, he got a specific recording studio built in New Jersey specifically for his recording purposes, but he continued on. Now, the thing that's interesting is that if you've ever listened to a Blue Note recording, you've got a general idea of what we call the Blue Note sound. For me, this is the Blue Note sound was playing in the background right here. Okay, this is the great Bobby Timmons soloing on a recording by the great Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, 1960. That's their album, The Big Beat. And the great Bobby Timmons is playing a solo. That's the Blue Note sound. Now, if you've never heard a Blue Note album, well, you haven't been listening to jazz long enough. So sooner or later, you gotta get around to getting some, some Blue Note recordings because it, they're, they're what the historical documentation of jazz that is on Blue Note records is essential. And, and some of the greatest jazz artists of all time are on the Blue Note label. So you can't, it's not something you just skip over. You really have to uh, stop and take a listen to this label and the artists that are on it. But the thing that's uh, surprising is that the Blue Note sound remained pretty much consistent from 1953 to 1967, which is the years that Rudy Van Geller was making the recordings for the label. And so over a, about a 15 year period, he managed to maintain a consist consistently, consistently equal sound pretty much um, that you really could identify with if you were used to listening to Blue Note artists, Blue Note artists recording different recording dates for this label. Now, how did he manage to do this? Because he passed from the, uh, from the mono era, which lasted from 1953 to 1958. In 1958, everything pretty much switched over to stereo. While there was still a lot of mono recordings being done side by side with stereo, everything was slowly and gradually going towards stereo and eventually stereo, would, stereo recording would become the norm and we'd completely abandon the mono recordings. But whether you're listening to mono recordings of the 50s or stereo recordings of 58 and later on, you still get this consistent sonic quality and sonic signature that is proper to the Blue Note, what has been called the Blue Note sound, the Blue Note record sound, which is the Rudy Van Gelder sound, as I said at the beginning. But a lot of people say that in order to maintain this consistency over the years, uh, that Rudy had to change the sound, modify the sound of the artists. Uh, in order to fit a certain kind of sonic quality that was specific to what Rudy himself wanted as a sound, as an overall sound to come out of these recordings, of these recording, these different recording sessions with these different great musicians. So some people uh, have criticized his recording methods. He was pretty peculiar about uh, his approach to recording. He was secretive. He didn't want people to know exactly what he was doing. Uh, let me just read a little extract here from the uh, Wikipedia article on Van Gelder, which specifically speaks about what is called the Van Gelder sound, which can be called, as I said, the Blue Note sound. They say here, Van Gelder was secretive about his recording methods, leaving fans and critics to spe speculate about his techniques. He would go as far as to move microphones when bands were being photographed in the studio. Now, can you imagine that? If bands were being photographed in the studio and he knew that these photographs were 
going to be seen by the outside world, by many people, by other recording engineers, he would move the microphones so that people studying the photos could not figure out exactly how he was positioning his microphones in order to make his sound take. Now that is pretty special. That means he was very, very cautious. He didn't want people to, he was sort of had a, wanted to have a prerogative on his sound. Didn't want anybody to imitate or copy his recording techniques. The article continues, his recording techniques are often admired by his fans for their transparency, warmth, and presence. That is one definite great characteristic of the Blue Note records. The presence is really, really strong. The presence of the instruments, the presence of the artists through their instruments uh, is really, really felt in a strong way when you, when you listen to any kind of Blue Note recordings done by Van Gelder. Uh, Richard Cook called Van Gelder's characteristic method of recording and mixing the piano as distinctive as the pianist playing itself. So here's one guy that says, aha, but his way of recording and mixing the piano transforms the sound because his way of mixing and recording this is as distinctive as the pianist style itself. So here's one guy that says, okay, Rudy is not just recording the sound, making a sound take to try and give you the sound as is, so to speak. He's modifying the sound. He's playing around with the sonic qualities. He's modifying it. Um, so the article goes on to say, <clears throat> Blue Note president and producer Alfred Lyon, even him, criticized Van Gelder for what Lyon felt was his occasional overuse of reverb and would jokingly refer to this trait as a Rudy special on tape boxes. So even Alfred Lyon, you know, sometimes when he listens to some of the recordings, he said, ah, oh, he's using a lot of reverb on this one, and Alfred didn't like that too much. He preferred a, uh, a, a uh, more flatter sound. Uh, and despite, the article continues, his prominence in recording jazz, some artists avoided Van Gelder's studio altogether. So, some people did not like this Blue Note sound, this Rudy Van Gelder recording sound that he was getting. Uh, and one of those people was the great Charlie Mingus. And the article says the bassist and composer, Charles Mingus, refused to record with him. Taking Leonard Fetter's blindfold test in 1960, Mingus said that Van Gelder tries to change people's tones. I've seen him do it, I've seen him do it, I've seen him take Tad Jones, and the way he sets him up at the mic, he can change the whole sound. That's why I never go to him. He ruined my bass sound. So this is what Charlie Mingus said about Van Gelder's recording techniques. So Mingus uh, seems to have spotted that and disliked it very much and said, that's it, I'm never recording with that guy. I don't like the sound that this guy is producing and how he's modifying specifically the sound in a certain specific way to, in order for, to achieve a certain quality of sonic detail uh, that is pretty much the same for throughout all the recordings he made for Blue Note. It's pretty pretty close anyway from one recording to another. No matter how many artists you change, you know, you get pretty much a sonic quality that's very close. Whether you're listening to Thad Jones, whether you're listening to Lee Morgan, whether you're listening to uh, Donald Byrd uh, or others, you're always getting a, a sound that's pretty close to the other, you're, get, you're getting distinctive playing styles, of course, very distinctive, but the overall sonic quality is uh, pretty much uh, resembles uh, other sound takes and other sound recordings with different artists. So that's why uh, Mingus would never go to him, didn't want to go and record uh, for Blue Note with Van Gelder. And critics of the Van Gelder sound in the 50s and 60s have focused mainly on his recording of pianos in particular, the article says, the best Van Gelder recordings feature wonderful sounding brass, bass walks, and cymbal shimmers. Now that's very true. Anybody who's listened to uh, any Blue Note recordings of that period, the 1953 to 1967 the period that Van Gelder was active with the label, and that's the period, of course, that where all the greats, all the really famous artists came through, and it's the period that most people that are collecting Blue Note records now are concentrating on. This is really the golden age, if you want, of uh, 
of Blue Note. Uh, and uh, so people that have listened to those sound takes, critics have said that mostly it was the piano. They don't agree, agree with that, the, the sound take of the piano. They say that he rarely got the sound of the piano right. On most of his albums, the piano sounds hooded, whatever that means. Some engineers suspect that this was due to reflections over the piano brought on by the shape and size of his parents' living, rooms, living room and later his studio. It may be significant in this regard that his best sounding album, according to these critics, is Eric Dolphy's Out to Lunch because it does not feature a piano. So again, you've got critics that didn't like the Blue Note sound, didn't like the sound that Gelder was producing. And he was also criticized for his use of compression and high frequency boosting, both of which it is argued compromised the sound. Journalist and radio producer George Hicks wrote this. For many of us in the recording trade, Van Gelder might be the most overrated engineer in audio history. Van Gelder would alter the sounds of the individual instruments. So that's a direct accusation. This guy is saying, no, he was altering the sounds of the individual instruments to make them then sound completely different. He says not only did he alter the sounds of the in individual instruments, but of the entire recording with compression, equalization, and reverberation, both as they were being recorded and after. But to me, the so-called blue note sound, he says, has always been a musical rather than an audio innovation. And Van Gelder was less a peerless technician than a sonic visionary. Now that's interesting because this guy has a different perspective. He says that this is what the Blue Note sound is all about. It's about Rudy Van Geller's sonic vision, his own personal vision of how these jazz artists and how jazz should sound on record. And we must say that he did shape the way that an awful lot of jazz sounds on records because he recorded hundreds of albums for Blue Note between 1953 and 1967. He also recorded hundreds of albums for Prestige, Savoy, Argo, Impulse, all kinds of jazz labels. He recorded all over the place for all kinds of companies. So he does, for one single engineer, he does get to shape the sound of an awful lot of jazz recordings over the years over a period of maybe 20, 30 years, because he, he kept on going after Blue Note, he kept on recording. I think his last recording was done just a few months before he passed away in 2016. So he, he remained in the recording realm for all those years. And we've got him to thank for that specific Blue Note sound, the distinctive sonic qualities that you find on your Blue Note recordings when you're listening to a Lee Morgan, uh, 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 Hank Jones, or a or a Donald Byrd, or a Jimmy Smith, or whoever you're listening to, one of those great artists, you've got Rudy Van Geller to thank for that sound take. Here's, for instance, the great uh, guitarist, uh, who is it, uh, I forget his name. No, Kenny Burrell. Kenny Burrell playing. And uh, again, beautiful sound take, beautiful sonic detail. All the work of the great Van Gelder, the Van Gelder sound, the blue note sound. So, that being said, once Van Gelder transitioned into the digital era, it was interesting because his recordings, if you listen to the stuff he did digitally, now he did not continue with Blue Note, Blue Note still exists today. They're still producing jazz records, modern recordings, digital recordings. Uh, they are spending a lot of time reissuing all the old classics, of course, of the Van Gelder era. But he did transition to the digital realm. Uh, and transitioning to the uh, digital realm, Van Gelder kept a consistency in his way of recording. Again, if you listen to a digital recording done by Van Gelder, you'll get a sound that's pretty close to the analog sound that you'll find on these classic Blue Note recordings, on this 
famous, that made this famous blue note sound, that created this blue note sound. Why is that? Because you've got the same engineer doing the recording, and he had a way of balancing out the instruments on these sound takes that would give a very, very good sonic result. And that is why you get a really, really good recording, even in the digital era. And he had this to say, and this is interesting, because Van Gelder commented on the digital era, and he had this to say about the bad sounding, so to speak, digital recordings of today. And Lord knows there's a lot of recordings that don't sound all that great that are digitally made today. I've got several jazz recordings that are terrific performances, but the sound, it's just, it just doesn't sound as good as these these old recordings from even from the 50s or even some of them from the late, late 40s have got better sound, I find, it, than some recordings of today. But here's why, and here's why, here's what Van Gelder says is the fundamental re reason why these recordings are bad. And he says this, he says, the biggest distorter of sound was the LP itself. I've made thousands of LP masters. I used to make 17 a day with two lats going simultaneously. And I'm glad to see the LP go. As far as I'm concerned, good riddance. It was a constant battle to try to make that music sound the way it should. It was never any good. And if people don't like what they hear in digital, they should blame the engineer who did it. Blame the mastering house, blame the mixing engineer. That's why some digital recordings sound terrible and I'm not denying that they do, but don't blame the medium. So what Van Gelder was saying was these bad recordings are the reason why today the Blue Note record label has lost that great Blue Note sound that we like so much from the 50s and 60s. It's not because it's become digital just like all the other companies. It's shifted over to digital recording, but it's because the recording engineers don't know how to balance their sound, don't know how to make a sound take that will bring out the kind of sonic detail that a Rudy Van Geller was producing and was able to get and go and capture through his use of microphones and different recording techniques. So that is the original, the origin of the Blue Note sound is to be found in the great Rudy Van Geller. So all of you who enjoy the great Blue Note sound, that's the man you have to thank. And that's my little episode for today. If you enjoy these episodes where we discuss different subjects related to jazz, I have the Jazz and Blues audio file. Go ahead and subscribe down below. And uh, we'll talk to you a little bit later. Leave some comments if you want. I enjoy comments. I enjoy interacting, speaking with people, and discussing all things jazz related. And until next time, as I always say, leaving you on these notes of the great Sidney Bechet performing Summertime, one of the earliest Blue Note recordings. Jazz on, everybody. Jazz on. Talk to you next time.